Jim is a former Rotarian in Conway. Jim is also the president and CEO of Aqua Shields Enclosures in Little Rock. Aqua Shield manufactures aluminum enclosures, which are utilized in the waterworks market space. The product produces domestic water and fire valves from freezing, vandalism, theft, and allows for safe entry for plumbers and backflow testers. Jim maintains accountability for the su success of the business, including operations, account management, customer service, business development, estimating, and engineering. He is proud to continue to manufacture items in the United States. AquaShield is a local manufacturer that is globally competitive. A native of Rosebud, Arkansas, Jim attended Hendricks College, graduated from the University of Alabama, and received his MBA from Christian Brothers University. Jim resides in Little Rock with his bride, Deanna, and two of his five sons. He is an avid, avid college football fan, as well as a founding member of the Bull Moose Football Club. Whenever possible, he enjoys golf and the general pursuit of tomfoolery. Welcome to Club 99, Jen. Next, we have Wade Palmer. <laughs> Wade is a former Californian Rotarian, where he was active in Studio City Rotary Club and was a founding member of the Sherman Oak Sunset Rotary Club. Wade is a seasoned executive with over 20 years of experience in developing and directing strategic national marketing initiatives. He has a strong track record of success in product development, sales and marketing, as well as expertise in channel development, market penetration, and budget administration. Wade has held various leadership roles, including sales and market manager at Serve Pro Little Rock, general manager of Serta Pro Painters, general manager at Fast Signs National, and commercial sign and, sign and graphic sales overlay at FedEx office. He has been recognized for his achievements, such as increasing sales, improving team performance, and leading successful rebranding efforts. Wade and his wife Connie have been married for 37 years and enjoy hiking and traveling. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Little Rock, Wade. We're glad you're here. Thank you, Pam and Molly. Congrats, Wade and Jim. Welcome to Club 99. Our new member streak continues. Anybody know? 37. All right. Look, look at Jake back there. All right. And we got 50 and 51. So I said, who wants to be 50? So I guess we'll have to technically be Jim since he was introduced first. But thank you to both of you for being part of the club. Uh, let's continue. Can we go ahead and expand that goal to a little bit higher, Molly, now that we're two months left? Can we? All right. So we're, I think that's a yes. So we're going to keep it going. Appreciate all of you being a part of this uh, successful uh, recruitment year. And I'm grateful to all of you for being a part of making uh, Rotary a desirable place to be every week. I uh, also want to acknowledge our past president, Greg Flesher. Thank you for being here. Always great to have our past presidents in the house. I see several, but we don't get Greg as often. So... Uh, Jamie's going to do a recruitment push to get him back, too. So keep it going, Jamie. Uh, next week, we're going to have a really cool program. We're going to get an update on Lyon College Institute of Health Sciences and One Health's efforts to locate the state's first dental and vet graduate schools in downtown Little Rock. So we're going to hear from the president of Lyon and the president of One Health. I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. They promised to share some potentially renderings and maybe economic impact studies. So I think it'll be a really newsworthy program as well. Uh, so I look forward to learning more about the impact that school will have on downtown Little Rock. Uh, as a reminder, be on the lookout for an RSVP from the, the club for the Ottenheimer International Scholars Program. The 75th anniversary gala is going to be at AMFA. It's an incredible new facility. If you haven't seen it yet, get over there and see it. And if you want to wait, come see it with us or come back with us on May 23rd. That's going to be an incredible evening 
celebrating the 75th anniversary of this incredible program. Um, we're going to have entertainment by Rodney Block. That's going to be amazing. It's going to be kind of a reception style, mix and mingle. We'll have international food, uh, different styles of food at different uh, tables. Kind of a, uh, not really, it's not a sit down per se, but it's going to be a really heavy hors d'oeuvres type meal. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We've got Cranfer Co. did a incredible video uh, Chris Cranford did on the uh, Ottenheimer program. Our Congressman French Hill is in there and he shares stories about his grandfather and their interaction with Senator Fulbright. It, it's pretty special. Uh, please make an effort to be there. No new meeting that day. Uh, and finally, if you're interested and want to help, we need you uh, to make up the difference. It's a little more expensive. No, don't listen, Stephanie to go have a meal there than it is here at the library. So please, if you can, for this special event, if you got a thousand bucks laying around and want a tax deduction, please let us know. We need it for sponsorships. All right, so now, uh, during our La Petite Roche Tricentennial, as many of you know, I will spend my year as Rotary President telling unique stories about our region's past 300 years. And as also most of you probably know, um, thanks to the efforts of past President Jeff Hildebrand and President-elect nominee Jason Chaco and the Special Tornado Relief Recovery Committee, uh, we're going to be raising the profile of our late club founder, Sid Brooks, through donations given to our foundation for tornado relief efforts. So with that in mind, I'd like to share more about the founder of Club 99. Sidney M. Brooks was born on September the 24th, 1886 in Memphis, where he was raised. Uh, he had a pretty troubled childhood. Uh, his father died when he was 13. Uh, he had a drinking problem. The young boy vowed to never have or drink hard liquor, and he never did. But thanks to the generosity of his father's friends, they gave him a loan of $4,000 so he could go to Harvard. He there graduated with a doctorate in philosophy and a law degree. And afterwards he went to Chicago to work for the Continental Illinois Bank and Trust Company where he made $150 a month in the trust department. With the foreshadow to the future, however, he was also assigned to manage the bank's advertising. And once on a bank train trip to Texarkana, he was asleep when the train came upon a wreck on the track ahead. Not able to finish its route that morning to Texarkana, Brooks got off in Little Rock. The delay allowed him the opportunity to see his old Memphis friend, Fred Alsop, who was then the Arkansas Gazette's business manager. After lunch and a streetcar ride, Fred told the young man that he should get his own business. Why not an ad agency? And so what follows is a quote from the Arkansas Gazette. I went back to Chicago and told my boss that I was thinking about going to Arkansas to open my own business. And my boss said, Brooks, you'll starve to death in Arkansas. Of all the godforsaken places in the world, why would you want to go to Little Rock? but I did it anyway. It was the first advertising agency in Arkansas. I not only had to sell myself, but I had to sell the idea of an agency. It was a struggle, and I made it. I just threw myself into every civic thing in town for a selfish reason to make friends. And getting to know early in his career the powerful Harvey Crouch, who started what is now Entergy Arkansas, was huge for him. It solidified his place within important Arkansas business circles and provided stability for his fledgling new ad business. The agency he founded in 1911 would retain the same name and ownership for 54 years. He even helped lead efforts to revamp the Little Rock Regional Chamber in 1914 and so many other endeavors in our state. But I believe it will be his efforts to make new friends and bring Rotary to Little Rock that will be his most lasting legacy. 
It was in July of 1913 when he invited four friends to join him as an organization committee for what would become the 99th Club in Rotary. That committee was expanded to constitute our 36 charter members and was officially chartered by Rotary International on January the 1st, 1914. Brooks would serve as our first president and was, get this, our secretary for 38 years. It's incredible. Mainly because no one else would do it, <laughs> but probably more realistically because no one else was any better. He also helped organize Rotary Clubs in North Little Rock, Fort Smith, Hot Springs, and Pine Bluff, and like Governor David Menz, he served as a district governor. He truly modeled service above self. Sid Brooks was a remarkable man in so many ways. We're blessed to have him as our club's founder. One way we tried to honor his legacy is through our Sid Brooks Fellows Awards, which were started in 2004, following the untimely death of Larry Washka. President of the Club 99 Foundation at the time, the first Sid Brooks Fellow Award was given to him posthumously. And for a donation of $1,000 to our Club 99 Foundation, you can also honor someone who exemplifies service above self. More than 40 Rotarians have been given this prestigious local award over the nearly past 20 years, and many more will soon follow. Brooks died at the age of 98 on May 1st, 1985, 38 years ago this Monday. In his obituary, it stated that the object of Rotary to encourage and foster the ideal of service as a basis of worthy enterprise was truly a mark of Sid Brooks. Based on the impact he and others have had through Club 99 over the past century plus, I believe we'd all agree he certainly did that. And that's our Illuminating the Rock story for this week. I'd like to thank Jan Allman and his great granddaughter, by the way, uh, Larry's wife, for sharing with me newspaper clips to help share his story today. And now I'd like for Marsha DiCarlo to introduce this week's special program. Marsha. Good afternoon. I'm Marisha DiCarlo. I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce today's panelists who are going to address a topic that is critically important to our state. Did you know that right here in Arkansas, we have the highest rate of maternal mortality in the entire country, according to the latest data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention? We know that factors like a patient's health, preterm birth, access to quality care, and social drivers of health, like poverty, social support, and bias in policies, practices, and systems impact health. So we need to actually put thought and action around changing these outcomes for the women in our state. Our panelists today are just that, they are action leaders. So first, Dr. Gloria Richard Davis is a tenured professor, board certified in reproductive endocrinology and infertility and obstetrics and gynecology. She is a professor of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at UAMS. Dr. Richard Davis has served as Executive Director for the UAMS Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion since January of 2020, as well as Medical Director for the UAMS Physician Assistance Program. She has more than 25 years of experience in women's health and reproductive endocrinology and in general obstetrics and gynecology, and her research and passion is in health disparities that disproportionately affect women of color. She serves and has served in leadership positions in a variety of renowned medical professional societies and currently serves on the Arkansas Maternal Mortality Review Committee. Next, Dr. Pearl McElfish serves as the founding director of the Office of Community Health and Research at the University of Arkansas for the Medical Sciences, or UMS. Dr. McElfish is a national and international leader in food systems research and methodological research related to the best methods for conducting community-based participatory research and disseminating research results to participants and communities. 
In addition to her research, Dr. McElfish has led large inter and intra-institutional efforts to develop academic programs, graduate medical education, clinical programs, and population health efforts. Dr. Eddie Phillips is a familiar face in Central Arkansas, having served in important leadership roles in healthcare and as a physician for close to 50 years. As the Chief Medical Officer of the Baptist Health System, which includes 11 hospitals and more than 250 points of access across Arkansas, Dr. Phillips was part of the leadership team that guided the organization through the COVID-19 pandemic and partnered with state government to lead the response to community needs during the crisis. Prior to becoming Baptist Health's Chief Medical Officer in 2013, Dr. Phillips, who is a Little Rock native, impacted many lives as a successful physician in private practice for 33 years. With a specialty in obstetrics and gynecology, Dr. Phillips helped countless mothers deliver healthy babies into the world over more than three decades. And finally, our moderator, Annabeth Gorman, has committed to her professional life to public service with a specialized focus on advancing the status of girls and women in our society. In her tenure as CEO of the Women's Foundation, she is leading the effort for the foundation to be the leading equity partner in building women's economic security across the state of Arkansas. In 2022, she was the Democratic nominee for Arkansas Secretary of State, and in the same year, she was recognized as one of the 250 most influential leaders in Arkansas by Arkansas Business. She is widely recognized as a business and community leader, practitioner of economic development, and is a sought-after expert on the value of including women in the economy. Please help me welcome our, our panelists and others. And... So excited to introduce our other panelist. Please come forward. <laughs> well, I'm certainly not going to welcome her to the stage without at least saying her name out loud. Rosalind Perkins, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Rosalind uh, is with UAMS High Risk Pregnancy Program and is the director of that program. We're going to give her a moment to um, give, give some information about herself once our panel gets started. We want to go ahead and give a round of applause to our panelists and those who have joined us today. So please go ahead and join me. And then we are going to go ahead and kick off our panel by showing the trailer for Giving Birth in America, Arkansas. Since I've been pregnant, I haven't actually went to any kind of birthing classes. I've been pretty stable, even without the meds. Are you gonna miss me? I'll be back. I have to have a baby. You ready? I'm ready. I'm waiting on you. I am 39 weeks. It's a girl in your belly. In the postpartum, access to mental health care is a national problem. Some of it has to do with the lack of access to services when they don't have supportive networks of care. You can have a good day. And I think the whole system ends up suffering because of it. Hey, pumpkin. You ready for mom to come get you? It's been hectic. Last night, she didn't sleep at all. Last year, my mom passed away, and I knew that I wasn't gonna have that support system like I did when I had my son. I feel like I returned to work a lot earlier, but I needed the money. She's yawning a little bit. Having a baby in NICU is like going through the different stages of grief. When women have concerns about their bodies or concerns about things that are going on with them, they need to be heard. I guess there's going to be a certain point where I'm going to have to go back on my medication. People will come by, oh, let me see the baby, but nobody says, let me come see the mom. I just want to lay down. You just feel so many different emotions. My job does not offer maternity leave at all. It's just still adjusting to being a mom of two kids and having a work-life balance. Mental health services and mental health support is extremely important. Women should have a say in what happens with their health care. Is there anything that you need from me? If I could wave a magic wand, every woman would have access to maternity leave. That's what healthcare in Arkansas would look like. I love you. Hi. 
it's validating the moms, listening to the moms, helping them find solutions. Because girl, I'm a fight. I'm gonna fight with you. I'm gonna fight for you. Well, thank you so much, panelists, for being with us this afternoon. And I want to kick it off because we're going to, I want to define what maternal mortality is. And so I want to start with Dr. Phillips. We've just seen the trailer. There is a crisis. But tell us, like, what is that crisis? We know it can't be limited to Arkansas. What does it look like across the country? And, and how are we fitting in this national landscape? Well, I just want to encourage you, if you haven't, seen the movie and I'm sure you haven't because it doesn't come out till tomorrow night some of us got a link to watch it and it's extremely moving if you care about the state of Arkansas and its future and everything that's good about Arkansas I would encourage you to watch it and take to heart what's in there it's an excellent presentation well we we talk about maternal mortality and it basically is uh, basically any death that occurs at the time of conception until really a full year afterwards and you think you know, in this country, do women still die due to childbirth? Well, unfortunately, as we heard, uh, Arkansas is a leader in this. And it's, it's very unfortunate. Uh, what's the landscape that leads to this? In my opinion, there's, I think of a couple of things right off the bat. Number one is we really have a lack of providers. And I've really worried about this, particularly over the last year or two. And uh, we're in a crisis. Who's going to deliver your your grandchildren, your great grandchildren? I mean, we take it for granted that they're going to be seen and taken care of. And I've been around long enough. There, there's several moderate-sized communities in Arkansas that have no obstetrical providers whatsoever anymore. And we we have a lack of family practice physicians that practice obstetrics, we have a significant lack of obstetricians and gynecologists around the state, and you think, oh, we got plenty of them. No, we don't. I got to look in the other day, and it just at Baptist Health, I counted roughly 25 on our active staff, and I thought, well, in five or 10 years, where are these people gonna be? And half of them, I don't think, will be practicing. And it's, it's gonna be that way around the state of Arkansas. Uh, do we have midwives? Well, we have a few, but we don't have near what we need. Some of my colleagues will talk about that, and uh, we can talk later about some of the efforts that are being made to rectify this. The other thing that uh, mirrors the landscape around the country is, is the, uh, the patients themselves. Lifestyles are so different. Nutrition's horrible. Obesity is just an epidemic in this country. When I started practice, a long time ago, what, I didn't see anybody who weighed 250 pounds, 300 pounds. Now, you'd, you'd be amazed how many patients are in labor and delivery that weigh 350, 400, 450 pounds. And they're just saying, you know, large people have large babies. Well, that increases the cesarean section rate. And you say, well, cesarean section's not that big of a deal. It is on a 400 pounder. I promise you it is. And, uh, you know, in my own experience, I had one that, a patient that died, 400 pounder after a cesarean section after she went home from a, from a pulmonary embolus. Left a baby without a mother and it was simply because of her nutrition. And I told her right before she left the hospital, I said, I'm not mad at you, but we're gonna work on your nutrition and we're gonna lose weight. And she said, I'll be happy to help you. And I said, great, we're gonna do it. The next morning, I got a phone call that she was dead. And, you know, obesity leads to diabetes, hypertension. Hypertensive crisis in, in our pregnant patients is, is just horrible and accounts for a significant amount of, of morbidity and mortality. We think about drug abuse. We think about uh, psychological problems, suicide. There's so many things that we, we never thought about 20, 30 years ago, and it it mirrors the country without a doubt. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, May, we're sticking up on May, and May is Maternal Health Month. However, in April, we had a whole week for Black Maternal Health Week. So I want to move to Dr. Rashard Davis, and how is what's happening in Arkansas similar to what's happening across the U.S.? At US? How is our situation unique here, and 
are the minority populations disproportionately affected in our state? First of all, thank you for having this panel. It's a really critical topic. Um, when, I, when we look at maternal mortality across the U.S., it has increased, and we have to acknowledge that. Though in Arkansas, we have some unique circumstances. We know we're a rural state. We know that, as Dr. Phillips said, we don't have enough providers, but we also don't have enough hospitals. We have maternal deserts. And so 37 of our 75 counties are considered maternal deserts, which means they don't have a birthing hospital or obstetricians in them. And at least four of those are low access counties. So, so those are staggering statistics. When we look at what's happened probably over the, net, over the last four or five years, Arkansas has moved from 46, 47 to 50th. And part of that is when you look across the country at what other states are doing, they have enacted some initiatives to address maternal safety. And so we had just probably in the last three years uh, launched our Arkansas Maternal Mortality Review Committee. And so we've got about three years of data that we're able to analyze and begin to look at perhaps trends and, and recommend some intervention. We this year joined AIM, which is the Alliance for Innovation in Maternal Health. Um, we probably one of the last states to enact this. And, you know, so those things obviously have, have created some challenges for the state. But the, new, the good news is we're moving in the right direction. In terms of black mothers, what we know is that we incur three times the maternal mortality deaths as in comparison to white women. And we talk about those social determinants of health impacting outcome. Well, those determinants of health only 20%, when we say social determinants of health, those are the factors that affect our health outcomes. And only 20% of those factors are really affected by direct clinical care, what we do in our, in our, within our confines. The other 8% is really what happens outside. It's the environment, the, the built environment that the communities that people live in, do they have safe, uh, Say, are they safe? Can they go out and play and exercise, have uh, safe and healthy food access, et cetera? Then you look at those socioeconomic factors. What's the educational level? What's the employment, right? Uh, can, can and do they have health insurance? So all of those factors, that contributes about 40%. And then we also have um, the health, health behaviors. Are we, are we using tobacco, alcohol, et cetera? So risky health behaviors contributes about 20%. So we really have to work across a multi-sector in order to affect those outcomes. And even though we say social determinants of health is really driving a lot of what we see on the increased maternal mortality rates of black women, we also know that for even college-educated black women, they have five times the maternal death rate compared to women, white women, with high school degrees. So it's not all about just social determinants of health. There's the implicit bias, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and I say to people, I trained in the same systems as my majority colleagues. So I have to mitigate against some of those implicit biases myself as well as within our healthcare systems. We have some uh, structural racism that's embedded within them. And so again, we really have to address those issues before we can truly make a difference in our health outcomes. Thank you. You know, a not so fun statistic to add is that Arkansas leads the country in teenage pregnancies, 18 to 19 year olds. And I'm sure if we sliced and diced that by race and ethnicity, we're gonna see some, um, pretty obvious factors there. But so I, I'd heard of um, food deserts. I'd heard of banking deserts. Um, a term I heard last week was a mental health desert. Pope County in our, uh, Russellville has no mental health <laughs> facility. The school district has, actually has to contract here with Little Rock. Um, but maternal health desert was brand new to me. And it's shocking when you say almost half of our counties are a mental health desert. 
Uh, Dr. McElfish, you work with underserved communities across our state. Can you speak a little bit more to um, maternal care for these communities? And I know you specifically work in the Marshallese community. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to talk about some of the work that UAMS and others are doing across the state to address these issues. I also want to be very clear that it's, there, there are a lot of different complex problems, as you have heard Dr. Richard Davis and Dr. Phillips talk about, and it's going to take a lot of solutions coming together. There's not one magic bullet, but what I'm excited about is in the past year, there have really been a lot of exciting new efforts to really tackle this, and I've seen the state of Arkansas come together in a way that is really encouraging. So a few of the things that we are kicking off, um, we will be testing a program, building on the ANGELS program that I hope um, you talk about in a moment, to send moms home with telemedicine units and do an early follow-up call. So ACOG for a long time has recommended that we not just send um, women home after they have a baby and say, come back and see us in six to 12 weeks. That's a long time um, for particularly a new mom or an under-resourced mom. And so we're gonna be pilot testing a program where a nurse practitioner calls them 10 to 14 days later and does a depression screener and screen for things like hypertension and infection, particularly if they've, they've had a C-section, and then sending home things like a thermometer to uh, uh, try to catch infection early, and a blood pressure cuff. Those are pretty simple things that we think can have a really transformative um, uh, effect on particularly catching those early deaths postpartum. In addition, we're working on a project that would pilot delivering healthy foods to moms for throughout their pregnancy because as Dr. Phillips said, not only are women, more women overweight, but then they gain too much weight. And excess gestational weight gain is one of the primary predictors of things like cesarean section and other operative um, delivery as well as hypertension and gestational diabetes. And so those are a few of the things we're working on. Um, community health workers, doulas, nurse practitioners. Again, it's going to take 30 different things coalescing together to, to make this work for our communities. If we were gonna put those in buckets, I think workforce, as we've talked about, social determinants of health, and then healthcare navigation. Community health workers and doulas can be so effective in helping women who aren't used to the healthcare system navigate that healthcare system. Um, thank you. So Rosalind, we want you to introduce yourself. Tell us about your title and your, and your work briefly, but you, um, this, this film covers postpartum resources. Um, can you speak to the importance of prenatal care, and uh, we know that you're involved with in high-risk pregnancies, please. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm Rosalind Perkins. I'm an advanced nurse practitioner in women's health, uh, and I still practice. I'm over the high-risk pregnancy program. Uh, she referred to as angels. We used to <laughs> hold that name. We've changed it. Uh, and we do just a lot of case management and things like that around the state. We have uh, an outreach team that goes around the state to the delivering hospitals and implements uh, maternal safety bundles and things like that. So basically we deal with mostly high risk and trying to create access around the state through telemedicine. And uh, you asked uh, about the prenatal care, how important it is. And everything, if you guys are listening, is trending back to social determinants of health. It's trending back to uh, obesity, things like that. Uh, the prenatal care is extremely important because that's where you're going to build that foundation uh, for the best outcome for that mom. And to get her into the hospital as soon as possible is so important, or into her doctor's office to start that prenatal care. Reason being, there are a lot of moms that's walking around that are diabetics and they don't even know it. You'll get them in there and see them the first time and uh, their blood sugars, A1C is out of range, uh, blood pressure is elevated, things like that. Uh, the sooner they get in and get that under control and a plan put in place, uh, it's gonna create a better outcome on the other end. Um, additionally, education, we should start education related to pregnancy, 
things that can go wrong during the pregnancy as soon as possible. I even, I would love if we would have more preconception counseling, talking to moms even before they become pregnant um, and talk to them about the things that can go wrong. There are emergent warning signs, headaches, letting them know that if your head continues to hurt, if you're seeing uh, visual disturbances, that's important, you need to get to your doctor, things like that. So um, very important that we start that prenatal care early. Yeah, I feel fortunate to have had a baby in Pulaski County, I mean, where we have access to incredible resources. I was over there in the high-risk clinic because of my, my advanced maternal age. Love that moniker. Um, but talk to, back to you, Dr. Phillips. You've had 30 years of experience in the field. So tell us, what have you seen change in the landscape in 30 years? Well, one thing is... Uh, that I mentioned earlier was the uh, overall nutrition of our patients is, is really poor, and Roz is exactly right. Uh, we, we really need to see patients pre, preconception. Uh, you probably don't even know we can put women on a vitamin that reduces the risk of uh, spinal cord defects with the newborn. So we can almost eliminate that by just having patients on appropriate vitamins and uh, well nourished before they conceive. Um, so one thing that stands out to me that's changed over the years is when I first started, my C-section rate was around 8 or 10%. And I looked back through my, a book when I first started, and I thought I was misreading it. It said vaginal delivery, vaginal delivery, vaginal delivery. I mean, all of them were delivered vaginally. These were all thin patients. Uh, and now the C-section rate goes anywhere from probably not many people have a 25%, up to some people have a 40, 50% C-section rate. And most of it is due to the, the size of the patients, the size of the babies. As you probably know, diabetics have larger babies, uh, so they'll have nine, 10, 11, 12 pound babies. And you think, well, those babies will do fine. No, those babies are not well developed. They have lung problems. You'll see a 10 pounder back in the NICU that's struggling to be alive simply because their lungs aren't mature, even though it weighs 10 pounds. And that puts them at risk for head bleeds and all sorts of things. So the main thing I've seen is uh, the increasing C-section rate. And as I look back every day, I see providers that are no longer in the market and, and we just don't have people to take care of patients. Technology is great. I love it. We should embrace even more of it but you've still got to have providers putting their hands and their eyeballs on patients. You can't deliver a baby via telemedicine, right? I wish we could have. <laughs> so, um, Dr. McElfish, um, you're a researcher. What are key challenges that you see from maternal health here in our state? I think we've touched on most of them. Um, so I, I, I think that in addition to the key challenges, there are some key opportunities. Okay. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges right now is the lack of continuity of Medicaid for women after they give birth. And it's, an, it's something we have the opportunity to um, affect and hopefully in, in the special session to to really extend uninterrupted care to women on Medicaid for a full year. And one of the reasons that's so important and another driver that the research shows um, of, of maternal mortality is limited birth spacing. And so if a woman has a baby and then gets pregnant again before 18 months, then um, her, her likelihood of dying or having a morbidity or the baby dying or being in distress goes up exponentially. And, and also some of the financial distress. We, of course, want women to have babies when they want to have babies, but the problem is if they're not, don't have continuity of insurance, they cannot get the contraception they need, and then they are getting pregnant again very quickly. So I think that continuity of care uh, is is really incredibly important. If we could do one thing that I think would reduce maternal mortality, that that would be the one thing. Although again, want to reiterate, it is it is many many things. The other thing that that I would touch on that research shows is 
that there are great disparities, as, as we know, for, for uh, particularly African-American black women as, as well as Marshallese women. There are also strengths in these communities, and I think it's critically important that as we look for solutions, we build upon those strengths in the communities and don't alienate those patients more by just saying, well, it's, it's, it's their issue that there is maternal mortality, but really understanding that as a state, we have left many women behind and that it's our responsibility to solve that. And one of the ways that we can is by building upon the strengths in those communities. Um, thank you, you, you kind of teed up the next question for Dr. Rashard Davis. So you are in the health equity space. We just talked about inequities that are faced by um, communities of color how does this drive the work that you do every day? So as executive director for the Division for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, we are keenly focused on health equity and diversifying the workforce is a critical piece of that. You know, health equity really refers to everyone having the opportunity to be as healthy as they can. And what we know is that with a diverse workforce, everyone has better health outcomes. You think about uh, individuals from rural areas and from underserved communities, they are more likely to return to those communities and practice. So we really do need to make sure that we are reaching, educating, empowering the pool of applicants that we can get from those communities in order to really affect our health outcomes. And whether it's, whether you're a majority person in a community, when you have a diverse workforce, the outcomes are still better. And that's a diverse workforce, a healthcare, diverse healthcare workforce, yes. right? So um, I wanna move us into the solution, solution part because I want some time for questions from, from folks here today. So I like to, be sure that sometimes the word equity gets appropriated and, and it's a, now it's a bad word, but it's about access. Yeah. It's about access. It's accessing accessing things. So I want to start with um, you, Rosalind. So that's the issue for many um, Arkansans. It's access. So access to reliable internet, access to transportation, access to quality health care. How is your team working to eliminate health care disparities challenges to access? Uh, some of the things that uh, the High Risk Pregnancy Program um, has initiated and is doing is that we try to see the patient where they are or take the doc to the patient or the healthcare worker to the patient. We're doing that over telemedicine and of course uh, if you don't have good connectivity telemedicine is not going to work uh, for that patient. And so there are a lot of FCC grants. We have an e-link section that works with FCC opportunities around the state, uh, has done a lot of work with a lot of counties, getting them uh, access to connectivity, if you will. We still have, there are, we still have some little holes around the state <laughs> where people do not have that uh, connectivity. In those cases, we try to partner. Uh, you've heard uh, Dr. McElfish talk about um, communities that's coming together, working together, you have to think outside of the box. And even if you have to collaborate with the library in a town where you find a mom mm -hmm. that needs to speak with the MFM subspecialist, but she has no connectivity at home. Maybe she doesn't have a cell phone that's even working. Get someone to get them to the library, collaborate with that library and let them come in in a private space and be seen using one of their computers, things like that. Uh, we run a robust uh, telemedicine program that's geared towards high-risk pregnancies or moms with the carrying a baby with a fetal abnormality. That's a referral-based program. So it, you go back to the deficit that we have with OBs. If there's nobody in that town, she's still having to travel way somewhere to get to an OB doctor that would even know something's wrong to refer her uh, to our program. So those are just some of the ways we're trying to create that access. We do a lot of education around the state, well-based education for diabetes, things like that. We're doing quite a bit, but again, it's going to take a village, like that's been spoken of up here just recently, uh, working with the communities. Uh, it could be the church 
in a community out there in rural Arkansas, things like that. So connectivity, yeah, telemedicine is great, but you got to have the connectivity. So, so you know, I, I want to point out we've got a village up here on the stage, um, and so we're grateful to each of you. Um, I know that UAMS and their work with the DEI, but we also had the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. Um, I want to give you each an opportunity to talk to any solutions that you'd like to see. But I think today I just heard, you know, Governor Sanders um, issued like extended uh, maternity leave to uh, state employees up to 12 weeks now um, of maternity leave. So I think always the first step is recognizing that there is a problem. Like in, in Arkansas, we are at the top of this very problematic list. You know, would some, one of you like to speak to a solutions or some innovations that you would like to see in the state? Well, one of the ones uh, I would address would be, fortunately, we had a meeting with UMS just last week, and uh, they acknowledged that, yeah, we got a crisis, and it's, it's serious in the state of Arkansas for OB providers. And so at Baptist Health, with the assistance of our colleagues at UMS, we're going to uh, really explore either adding to the residency program in Little Rock or maybe even expanding into the GME program that we have over in North Little Rock. We have a residency program over there that graduates 12 to 15 uh, internal medicine and 12 to 15 uh, uh, family practice and uh, four psychiatry uh, physicians a year. Uh, so we're gonna expand the family practice to where we'll have a year uh, fellowship in OB and we can send out family practitioners who have been trained uh, for over a year in obstetrics to help alleviate the problems. In addition, uh, some of our hospitals uh, in our system in particular are uh, pursuing uh, using nurse midwives to uh, create more access. Right, and, and actually if you get to watch the film, there's a conversation about midwives and doulas. I, I'm, I'm looking at our time and I wanna make sure we have a couple questions um, and then there's any opportunity, we'll make kind of a close statement. But are there any questions from our, our, our members today? Oh, yes, Stephanie, please. I'm going to repeat the question. So we're talking about the high rates of teenage pregnancies in the state of Arkansas, access to contraceptives. Like, what can we do? What is being done that you might be able to share to, to address this and to, to help prevent um, teenage pregnancies? So I think a, a lot of that is uh, expansion, right, of access, whether it's through the health department, uh, Planned Parenthood, which, which everyone, you know, shrieks about, but they provide contraceptive access to women who are in these underserved communities. And, you know, I trained at a time when um, one of our key people in the contraceptive area really was pushing to have it be over-the-counter access, right? Because I think when you have to rely on a visit, a prescription, then it challenges, it puts up barriers. And we don't have enough access to, to providers to do that. I think the other thing is, again, when we talk about training up and expanding um, advanced practice people across the state, we really need to do a better job of incorporating utilization of, I, I'm the medical director for the PA program. We are underutilizing PAs and nurse practitioners in this state. And so that's another way that we can increase access. So partly I just want to say every, everything that Dr. Richard Davis said. Also, many of you may know that long-acting reversible contraceptives were passed in the last legislative session, which was a gigantic win, because a lot of teenage pregnancies are second pregnancies. About 50% of moms, um, teenagers who have a baby will get pregnant again within 12 months. So it's, it's astounding. And so if we can provide access to the long acting reversible contraceptives during that time period, it can really help 
give those Can young you moms educate control. everyone? People may not be familiar with that law that just got passed. I was going to say, and I, I, I can ed educate about the law. Um, probably others can educate about the procedure, but I think training nurses and family practice physicians now to do the insertion is going to be a, a critical component. But basically, um, before the, the legislation, um, the way that uh, Medicaid reimbursed, you had, if you put in a long-acting reversible contraceptive during the postnatal visit, it was not covered by insurance. And so you're asking the clinical provider to do this really complex, expensive, maybe not complex, but expensive procedure, and they could not get reimbursed for it. And so that lack of reimbursement meant that it was not done as often as it should be. So in many ways, it was a very simple fix that I think will have a profound impact. Thank you. I think we're so, going to have one more time. I'm so can, sorry. Can I just add? Sure. So the long-acting contraceptive really refers to devices like intrauterine, uh, intrauterine devices and the implants, which will last for some anywhere from three to five years. You don't have to rely on the user for effectiveness, so it is an extremely effective method of contraception. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? One, yes. Final question. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, he's asking about tort reform and malpractice for our folks listening online, please. Yeah, that's that's a huge problem. I was going to mention that is, is what could Rotarian, what could uh, – people do to, to uh, support uh, more providers in the state of Arkansas. Tort reform is, is so important. It's been passed in Louisiana. I think Dr. Richard Davis has some experience with that. It's been passed in Texas. And probably on a monthly basis, we lose physicians that uh, go to states where malpractice premiums are significantly less uh, than in the state of Arkansas. So if you can support tort reform, uh, that would help provi providers come to Arkansas. Thank you. Please give a round of applause to our panelists. So, if you want to learn more, there is a world premiere tomorrow night of uh, giving birth in America, Arkansas. Is there a QR code or a link to that? I think it's on the screen. So um, there are, it's a limited seating, but that's going to be the world premiere tomorrow night. Um, Chris, as a Christy Turlington Burns film. Um, so it's going to be at the Capitol Hotel. Encourage folks to learn about it or just to look that up. Um, but again, thank you so much. Uh, I think our panelists will hang around for just a few minutes if you want to ask some additional questions. But back to you, Denver. All right. Thank you, guys. Y'all are amazing. Uh, Marisha, thank you so much. Annabeth, Pearl, Roslyn, Dr. Richard Davis, Dr. Phillips, uh, maternal child health by the way, is one of Rotary's six pillars of service. So just know today you learned a little bit more about RI's mission around the world. Uh, and it's an important part of what we need to be thinking about uh, locally as well. Uh, board meeting is next at the porch at the uh, Clinton School. Uh, and I just want to give a quick shout out to Chris Bond, our program chair. Uh, this is the final quarterly panel series. It was his... Uh, uh, vision to bring policy issues to our club on a quarterly basis uh, and so this is the last one we did homelessness uh, mentoring foster care and now maternal health so thank you chris uh, you're an amazing job as our program chair we appreciate you um, next i have the uh, books uh, as part of our speaker series so if you guys will hang around we'll pass these out we're giving as part of our one of our other six pillars is literacy and so this year all of our speakers are getting a book uh, with your name in it as a appreciation for you being here today and a selection of these books will be given uh, to all of our area uh, libraries and resource centers and elementary schools so just want to say thank you your name will be listed in all those books as being part of our speaker series for this year uh, so please stick around for the photo and the introduction or the passing those out and then finally I just want to say a reminder, next week we will have an update on the state's first dental and veterinary graduate school planned for downtown Little Rock. 
Uh, I think it's going to be an incredible program. Don't miss it. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>